today, whoo, excuse me, sorry Tony. Today is an experiment and you are my guinea pigs. All right, sounds good. Um, don't know if this is gonna work, could fall flat on his face, but uh, it's all we've got to work with. I'm gonna pray for us because Lord knows we need it. And uh, yeah, as for those who I'm blocking the screen for, sorry, eventually we'll be in Genesis. 11:31 through 12:4, so like that section if you need to open up your bibles feel free but everyone else should probably be able to see that and see this we should be good i'm going to pray for us because lord knows we need it let's pray sovereign father we thank you and praise you for how good and gracious you are to us all the time uh, lord i just ask that you pour out your mercy upon our heads lord that we might see you for who you are that we might treasure you above all things that you might teach us what you would have us know through your text um, Lord, we've got a lot of ground to cover. I ask that you allow us to do it clearly, uh, that we might see you through this text. And again, Lord, uh, learn what you have for us. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So if you've been with us for the past three months or so, you'll recall that we've been in the book of Genesis. If you haven't been with us for the past three months or so, that's okay, because today we're kind of doing a little bit of an overview of where we've been thus far. We're going to take a look at the span of Adam to our new character, Abram or Abraham. Now, have you guys ever, like around the new year, um, how many, no, okay, I won't ask you to show your hands, but how many were actually able to finish our Bible reading plan last year? Don't raise your hands, all right, but if you did, you're super excited, you're like, ooh, me, and then everyone else is avoiding eye contact right now because, like, I totally forgot about that, right? But if you're anything like most human beings, like most believers, we oftentimes, at the beginning of the year, we think, I'm going to read through my Bible. And what happens is we get into Genesis, and about 13 days in, it gets a little tough. It gets a little thick sledding. We're deep into the genealogies. We're not understanding it, and we kind of leave it by the wayside. We move on until this time, and we think, dang it, I started that last year, and I didn't finish. Let me tell you why we have a hard time sometimes getting all the way through the Scripture. It's because it can oftentimes be confusing. It can oftentimes be overwhelming. It's incredibly dynamic text, and it's oftentimes hard to follow, hard to track, how hard to trace, hard to really get enthralled by the book. What I'm going to hope to do today is to give us a little bit of an overview of where we've been thus far so that we can make sense of where we've been so that we'll know where we're at and we'll know also where we're going in the life of Abraham. Uh, the way that we're going to do this is I'm going to simply ask two questions of the book Je of Genesis. Um, I'm going to ask what I think Genesis actually wants us to be asking, which is two questions. Genesis seems to be obsessed with two questions. The first question is this. Can man... Pray that stays. Can man trust God is the first question. And the second question is this. Nope. Second question is this. Will man trust God? All right. First question is, can man trust God? The second question is, will man trust God? I wanted that to be just right there where everyone could see it, right down there. Um, if you use those two questions and walk through the events of Genesis thus far, you're going to begin to see a pattern emerge. It's my hope that through these two questions, we can actually make sense of the story of Genesis. So, where does Genesis begin? Genesis begins with one man. What's his name? Adam and his wife, Eve. And the story seems to be very preoccupied with this one man. What do you know about him? The story begins with Adam. And the big question we want to ask of the text is, can Adam trust God? And the answer of the text is, yes, absolutely. Literally, God gives him everything. He creates the entire world. He gives Adam a really big backyard. Then he gives him a job. Then he gives him a wife. Then he gives him food. God blesses Adam up the, up the wazoo. It's not like Adam just pops up and he doesn't know who this God is. God is interacting with him on a regular basis. And so the big question is, can Adam trust God? And the overwhelming, resounding response of the text is, yes, absolutely. God is to him everything, has given him everything. Can Adam trust God? Absolutely, yes, 100%. Now the next question is this. Will Adam trust God? Does Adam trust God? And the response of the text is absolutely not. Shortly thereafter, after God gives them the instruction never to eat 
from the garden, never to eat from the tree that's in the midst of the garden, the middle of the garden, not to eat the forbidden fruit. What do we see Adam and Eve doing? Sinking their teeth into God's forbidden fruit, not trusting the Lord. Now, Adam falls, and we're going to follow that trajectory throughout the rest of the story. However, before we move on, there's something key and pivotal to understanding the book of Genesis, and it's the promise that God gives to Adam in the midst of his fall, right around the time of his fall, God gives Adam a huge promise. Do you know what it is in your mind right now? If you don't, Genesis probably won't make much sense to you because all of Genesis is all about following through on this promise. What is that promise? That promise is God saying to Adam and to Eve, one day I'm going to send a savior for you. He's going to crush the head of the serpent He's going to eradicate you from sin. He's going to save and redeem all of humanity. And it's going to come through you, Eve. That's the big promise that God gives Adam and Eve just as they begin to fall. Don't worry, I'm coming for you. And I'm going to come through you, to you through the seed of the woman. Which leads us into another theme in the book of Genesis. What is that theme? It's probably the reason you have such a hard time reading the book of Genesis. And that's this. It's the genealogies. You ever read through Genesis and it just seems like you can't pronounce all these names, you skip over that section and you move on? And you ask yourself, why is the text preoccupied with this? The whole, the primary reason why scripture is giving us a genealogy is because it is wanting to track and trace the promise of God to see if God will prove to be true, to prove whether or not man can truly trust God. That's what the genealogies are all about. <clears throat> so the story starts with man, a man named Adam. Can he trust God? Yes, absolutely. Does he trust God? No, he doesn't. And man falls. Then the story shifts from the man to his family, more specifically, his sons. Adam and Eve will have three sons. Do you remember who they are? It's Cain, it's Abel, and it's Seth. Two of them will prove to be righteous. One of them will prove to rebel against the Lord. Uh, and what is his name? His name is Cain. <clears throat> uh, we talked about how Cain's sin is actually likely worse than Adam's, Adam and Eve's because Cain, Adam and Eve got talked into their sin by the devil. Cain can't be talked out of his sin by God. God literally comes to Cain and he says, bro, sin is crouching at your door. It's desires to consume you. Don't walk out the door. Heed my call, heed my voice, don't leave, respond, trust me. And what does Cain do? Don't worry, God, I got this. Cain walks out the door, he ends up killing his brother, and the story spirals even further out of control. The story starts with one man, it leads to his family. His family makes a big, bad, dumb decision, and what we see is actually things get worse in the wake of that. Cain becomes, uh, Cain, Cain is a bad man, his family becomes seven times the son of hell that he is, is how we're supposed to see in the text. Uh, what we're supposed to see is that the uh, world, specifically related to Cain, begins to spiral out of control, following the ways of Cain. The world becomes very, very wicked. To the point where, how does the text describe the world? It says that the thoughts of man were only evil all the time. And what you're supposed to see in this text is not only is man, uh oh, is this one going to stay? Not only is man not trusting God, but it looks as though the promise of God is becoming less and less likely to be fulfilled because people are actively rejecting the Lord. If you remember when we talked about in Genesis 5 and Genesis 6, people are literally killing each other. It says that the world has become filled with violence, so mankind is pulling each other apart. But not only that, we see that, if you remember this passage, you remember this passage, where we talked about the daughters of men are intermingling with the sons of God, and we talked about that is either the people who are supposed to know God fully rejecting him and running off with the world, or that is mankind running after essentially other God, demonic beings, and trying to intermingle with them so as to snuff out the promise of God, which was that one day through their line and lineage, the Son of God, the Messiah, would one day come. And what you're supposed to see is that the text is getting darker and darker and darker, lower, 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 further and further away from God. And it looks as though the promise of God is not going to prove to be true because the world is utterly wicked. God is weeping over humanity. This looks horrible. This looks deplorable. It looks like the promise will never come true. But then what happens? 
Do you remember in the text? Uh, all, even our kids know this one. God responds with what? God responds with a flood. God sends a flood. And at first it looks as though God is sending a flood because God's a big jerk and he hates us. But actually, if you take a look at the text, what it says is that God sends the flood so as to save humanity, to keep us from destroying ourselves. If you remember in that text, it literally says, God says to himself, I will send down destruction on their destruction. I will corrupt their corruption. I will send cancer into their cancer so that the cancer will fail, so that mankind will be saved, which allows us to see that actually God, what he's doing is he's redeeming and he's saving the people. He's, um, he's actually allowing his promise to remain to be true because the seed is not snuffed out. Mankind is not able to destroy itself and God starts over again with a new man. Who is that new man? You know it. The man's name is Noah. Uh, literally, if you were with us in the passage um, as we were walking through this progression, we see that Noah is seen to be, by the text of Genesis, as the new Adam. God comes to him and says the same thing that he said to Adam. God comes to him and uh, gives him a new world. He gives him a special relationship with the animals like he did with Adam. And God says to him, be fruitful, multiply, go and fill the earth. Did something fall? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I really wish it was like, and then the promise came in and broke Noah. No, but it's, uh, that would have been cool. Uh, we see that Noah is, uh, he, he's uh, a man who actually, uh, yeah, he's just like the new Adam. God starts again. Genesis 1 and 2 are the creation story. Genesis 6 through 9 are the recreation story. Now, because you're a smart reader and you're dialed in, you're paying attention to the text, you're going to be thinking what the author of Genesis wants you to be thinking, and you're going to be asking the question, wait a minute, could this Noah be the long-awaited Messiah? Because you know that he's in the line of Seth, he's in the line of Eve, if you will, and he is, for us, effectively, the first main character, really, in the book of Genesis, to actually trust God. Will Noah tr can Noah trust God? Yes, absolutely. God says there will be a flood. And Noah says, okay, Lord, I trust you. And Noah trusts the Lord and a flood comes. And so you're supposed to be saying, wait a minute, is Noah the long-awaited Messiah? Because if you remember how Noah is described, he's described as blameless in his generation. He's described as perfect in his generation. He literally, God nukes the entire planet, but saves this one man and his family. And you're supposed to be thinking, that's the Messiah. That's the one who's finally going to crush Satan's head. That's the one who's finally going to defeat sin. That's the one who is the fulfillment of the promise. Is he? As you know, he's not. Why not? Because Noah proves to be just like his great-great-grandfather. Noah also will fall. Do you remember how Noah falls? He falls naked, like his predecessor. He falls with fruit in hand. This time it's not an actual fruit, it's a cup of wine, it's a glass of wine. He is ashamed. He's eventually covered. What we're supposed to see is Noah is just like his great-great-grandfather. He falls too. Now, before we move on with Noah's story, what we have to pay attention to is just like Adam, God gives Noah a promise around the time of his fall. What is that promise? The promise that God gives to Noah, you know it because you know the rainbow. God says, hey, Noah, don't worry. I'm never going to flood the earth again. And the question that Noah and the people have following this is, is God going to remain true to his promise? The story moves on. It starts with a man, then it goes to his sons. Noah has how many sons? Three sons. Ham, Shem, and Japheth. The story seems to dial in on one son in particular. Who is that son? That son is Ham. If Cain is known for being physically abusive. Ham is known, known for being what? I'm say sexually abusive. If you were here for us that week, you'll recall that either Ham makes fun of his father sexually, Ham takes advantage of his father in that capacity, or as we saw in the Leviticus passage, it could be that Ham actually takes advantage of his mother. Either way, what we're supposed to see is we're supposed to see a repetition of the cycle where there's one man who at this time ultimately does trust the Lord but still falls and then we follow his sons, who two are righteous, one is very unrighteous, that's Ham. And what we're supposed to see is that effect in the son spreads to the greater community to where now, as we get around 
Genesis 11, we see that it's not the world that's considered and deemed wicked. It's a valley. Which valley is it? The Valley of Shinar. You know it as the land of Babel. What you're supposed to see is a repetition in the text where we've narrowed our focus a little bit from a wicked world to now a wicked valley. We've taken a look at one man who, this guy does trust God, but he still falls. His son doesn't trust God, and that leads to great wickedness. And the big question that we're supposed to have is, is God going to remain true to the promise that he gave Noah of not flooding the earth, even though mankind is running away from the Lord? Like we talked about in the recap video, like we talked about three weeks ago, the people of Babel are given the instruction by God I want you to be fruitful, I want you to multiply, and I want you to go and fill the earth. And what do they do? They all bunch up together. And they build for themselves a city to provide for themselves their own security. They provide for themselves a tower so that they can either access God in an illegitimate way or access illegitimate gods. And then they want to make a name for themselves because they don't want to glorify the Lord, they want to glorify themselves. What you're supposed to see is the Valley of Shinar, Babel is the zenith point of rebellion against God. We are shoving him out, we are pushing him away. This is just like what we saw in Genesis 6. The people are doing the same thing. They're rebelling against the Lord. The big question that we have to ask is, is God going to nuke them like he did the previous generation? And you say, well, no, he's not because he promised he wouldn't. Listen, you and I know that to be true because hindsight is twenty twenty, and because we trust the promises of God. But what you have to understand is the Valley of Shinar did not believe that. They thought that God was going to nuke them with a flood. They did not trust the promises of God. How do you know that? Because remember, how did they build their city, their tower? They built it with bitumen. They built it with pitch, which is what? A waterproof substance. Basically what they're saying is we want to build a tower so that if God sends the flood waters down again, we can escape them. They're not trusting the promises of God. They're trusting in themselves. They're rejecting the Lord. Mankind is as it's always been, not trusting a God who is very trustworthy. So the question that we have now is, is God going to nuke them with a flood? Or is he going to be true to his promise to never do that again? Well, you know how the story goes. What does the Lord do? God does not send down floodwaters from heaven. Rather, he sends down a flurry of tongues. And God scatters the people like he wanted, like he intended for them all along to be spread out. If you remember in that story, it literally says that God blessed them and told them to spread out and they refused to be blessed and they bunched up together. And God says, okay, I'm not asking anymore. I'm going to send you tongues to where you get, you basically get confused and you fight with each other and you have to spread out. God in this whole thing is redeeming them, not actually by punishing them, but by blessing them with allowing them to do what he called them to do all along. And then the story starts over once again with one man. Who is that man? He is um, going to be the focus for our study uh, in Genesis for the next few weeks because he occupies the next few chapters, in fact, quite a bit. Who is that man? His name, at first, is Abram. It later becomes Abraham. I'm probably going to use those names interchangeably, and that's my last qualifier for that. I'll assume that you know who I'm talking about when I talk about them. But now, look, the cycle starts over again. And the big question is, can man trust the promises of God thus far, despite the stupidity, despite the rebellion, despite the sin of the people, God has always proven to be true in his promises and the fact that mankind has not been fully wiped out, which allows the promised Messiah to come forth through the line of Eve. Uh, Thus far, God has not sent a flood. When God told Adam, in the day you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. God was true to that promise. God has always been true to his promise, always been true to his word, despite the fact that every time, that's an overstatement, many, majority, most of the time, mankind has rejected him. But now, we come to a new man. And we ask the question, um, not only can Abram trust God, God has proven himself, but the big question you're supposed to have on your mind as we jump into this new cycle is, will Abram trust God? At the same time, to start this new cycle, God's going to give us a series of new promises. So before we can maybe talk about um, whether or not Abram does trust God, we have to ask the question, what is he going to trust God with? That's what our text is all about this morning. If you will, turn your attention to the screens um, where we will read off the promises that God gives to Abram. Again, that section, I'm so sorry. Just take my word for it. Here we go. I'm going to read it out loud. Genesis 
Genesis 11.31. These are the promises that God gives to Abram. A little bit of context on where he comes from. Terah, Abram's father, took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son, Abram's wife. And they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205, and Terah died in Haran. You go to the next one, Miss Leah, thanks. Now the Lord said to Abram, these are the promises, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Okay. Genesis 12 is a huge chapter in all of Scripture where we are given the covenant promises of God that are eventually ratified in Genesis 15. Where God gives Abram big promises, what are they? We're going to describe them as three. He promises to make Abram into a great nation. He promises to make Abram's name great. And he promises to give him natural resources. Okay? I'm a Baptist pastor, all right? I like alliteration, all right? So I've got three ends, but a better way to say it is he makes him a nation, he makes him into a name, and he's going to give him a land. But I'm gonna say natural resources, and you'll know what I mean. In, 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 it just helps stick in my mind, okay? God comes to Abram, and he says to him, Abram, I want you to go from your country, I want you to go from your kindred, I want you to leave all your people, you can bring your wife, it's kind of implying to the text, you can leave, bring your wife, but I want you to leave everybody else, and I'm going to make you into a great nation, I'm going to give you a great name, and I'm going to give you a land. Now, you're immediately supposed to see huge red flags and problems with that. What's the problem with that? Abram's an old dude, and God says, I'm going to give you many descendants, and both he and his wife are well past, at this point, well past having kids. So that's a little weird. Not to mention... God says, Abram, I'm going to give you a great name. Do you remember a time in Genesis where people tried to make a name great for themselves? Where was it? It was in Genesis 11, the chapter that precedes this. It was the people of the Tower of Babel. We're going to make our name great. And now all of a sudden God comes to Abram and says, I'm going to make your name great. And Abram would have been like, I know what happened to the last group of people that tried to do that. Nobody can pronounce their name. They're considered fools. They're considered jokes. So there's a big problem right there. And not to mention, God says, I'm going to give you a great land. Here's the problem. The land that he's going to give to Abram is already occupied by a big, bad group of people, the Canaanites. So it already looks like God's promise to Abram is utterly ridiculous. It can't be done. I'm old. You're going to give me descendants. Why do I know that Abram thinks that? Because, well, our big question is this. These are the promises of God. Can Abraham trust them? Yes, he can. Man, it would be hard to do. None of us in this room have been called to, I can't imagine any of us in this room, have been called to believe God on such a radical promise of, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to give you a great land. I'm going to make your name great. This is Abram. He's looking at retirement. He's about to check into a home, and here God comes to him and gives him this prospect. The big question is, will Abraham trust God? Will he break this cycle? Let me ask you this. If you know the story of Abraham, answer that question in one word. Will Abram trust God? It's almost a trick question because that is really hard to answer in one word. The best way I can describe it in one word is this. Will Abraham trust God? The word is eventually. Little by little, more and more, step by step, inch by inch, day by day, week by week, year by year, eventually Abram is going to get it and it's going to break the cycle. But before we go there, God wants us to walk on the journey of Abram's rebellion, if you will, and his ever-increasing trust of the Lord. Because Abram is also going to step into the cycle. In fact, you just watched him take the first step into it. When God says, go and leave your kindred, leave your family, what does Abram do? Come on, Lot, we're heading out. Boom, that's not what God called him to do. What we're going to see in this text is Abram, to a great degree, falls like his predecessors. And Abram's going to have three sons. Who are Abram's three sons? Now, that's a trick question. Because Abram really only has, depends on how you cut the cake, he has one son that God acknowledges Two sons if you count Ishmael. Three sons if you count Lot, which is what Abram's doing in his mind. Abram is thinking. 
He just heard the promise of God. God, you're going to make me into a great nation. Okay, I can't have any kids, so I'm going to turn to my next heir. I'm going to look to someone who else, who I, who I can maybe have this through. I'll grab a family member. I'll bring Lot. It'll be through Lot, my son, who I'll adopt as my own, and he will be the one with which the Lord blesses. Uh, what we see is um, Abraham has three sons. One, uh, two trust the Lord, and actually Lot is considered to trust the Lord by the New Testament standards, but we'll get there when we get there. Um, but the story, at first, lands on Lot, this character Lot, who Abram brings with him. Lot uh, will be a fool. Lot will not trust the Lord like Abraham will at times. And through the folly of Lot's decision, he's not going to land in a wicked world. He's not going to land in a wicked valley. Where is Lot going to land? You know this. Another famous story in the book of Genesis. He's going to land not in a wicked world, not in a wicked valley. He's going to land in a wicked city. What's the name of that city? Sodom and Gomorrah. And we're back on the cycle where people are actively, aggressively rejecting the Lord. And the big question is, how is God going to respond to it? What is God going to do? This time, God, uh, true to his promise, doesn't send down a flood. Uh, he also doesn't send down tongues. The wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah is uh, so great that God is going to send down fire from heaven. Destroy and consume that area while at the same time redeeming and saving Lot and a few of his family members. And the cycle starts over again with Abram. Abram, will you trust me? I'm going to give you children. I'm going to make you into a great nation. It's not through Lot. I'm going to give you a child. Will Abram trust God? We jump into the cycle again. Who's the next uh, child that Abram has? Ah, Lord, okay, this time I'll trust you. This time I'm going to trust you and I'm going to have a son and it's going to be Ishmael, I'm going to sleep with my servant girl because my wife's way too old, and that's how you'll bless me. I'm going to take matters into my own hands. I'm going to have a son by not trusting your promises that's going to come through her, but I'll sleep with her, and instead it'll bring about Ishmael, and the cycle turns over again. Except for this time, have you noticed this, uh, the bottom point of each cycle is getting more and more narrow? At first, it's a wicked world, then it's a wicked valley, then it's a wicked city. And then we will see perhaps one of the most dramatic moments in all of Genesis. We will find ourselves in a very small scene in a very, very wicked desert. Do you remember the story of Ishmael and Hagar? It is a um, hard scene to watch, effectively, as Hagar goes to put her dehydrated son off in the wilderness to die. And she has to walk away lest she hear him screaming in the desert horrible situation to which, by the grace of God, God shows up and redeems. Not by sending a flood, not by sending fire, not by sending tongues, but essentially going to send Ishmael away. And as he does, he blesses him. We'll get there when we get there. And God comes once again to Abram. He says, Abram, this time I've proven myself. Will you trust me? And eventually, little by little, Abraham will trust God with Isaac. And the story will change its trajectory. The cycle will be broken. What we're going to be doing over the next few weeks, over the next few months, is hopping on this journey with Abraham and learning why, when he doesn't trust God, why he doesn't trust God. We're going to be able to see ourselves in that story just like Abraham, not trusting God with a thousand little things because we don't think God can handle them, not really trusting the promises of God. And yet, despite Abraham's folly, despite his sin, despite his stupidity, we will see, like we've seen in Genesis all along, that despite the sin, the folly, the stupidity of man, God's promises will still remain true. Here's what is so confusing about the story of Abraham, is Abraham keeps screwing up, and yet somehow it keeps working out for him. You read the story, and you're so frustrated. Next week where we're going is, Abram's going to go to Egypt. He's going to lie about his relationship with his wife. He's not supposed to be going to Egypt in the first place. He's going to be lying to Pharaoh, and somehow, despite all his lies, Abram's walking out of that situation a wealthy man. 
And you look at the story, and this is why we have a hard time with Genesis, we look at the story and we say, that's not supposed to happen. You're right, it's not supposed to happen if God treats us according to our faithfulness, but that's not how God works in the book of Genesis. He treats us according to his faithfulness. He treats us according to his promises. This is going to be true of Abraham. This is going to be true of Isaac. This is going to be true of Jacob, all of whom are huge screw-ups who should be trusting God, but don't trust God. And when you look at it, you actually look in the, in the text and you don't see a story, you see a mirror. It's bouncing back your own lack of trust with the Lord. And slowly, eventually, little by little, step by step, inch by inch, day by day, week by week, the text begins to work on you as it works on these men to empower you to finally do what we can do all along, which is to trust the promises of God. The book of Genesis is all about God remaining true, though mankind remains false. And it's all about us eventually learning that and embracing that to where we're finally going to get to the point where Abraham trusts the Lord so much and the promises that he's given him, specifically through Isaac, that Isaac is going to be a great nation, that through him he's going to bring about many descendants, to the point that Abraham trusts that so much that he's even willing to take Isaac's life himself, knowing that if Abraham kills his own son, God will bring him back to fulfill his promises. That's how much, that's how strong Abraham's faith is going to be because that's, he realizes how strong God's promises are. So, this is what you can expect moving forward in the book of Genesis. And then we get back to where we were all along with two big questions. The first one is, can man trust God? No, I can't trust my little sticky things. Can man trust God? Can I trust this little board thing? Hold up. No. <clears throat> Dramatic effect. Shattered. All right. We're back to our two questions. The first one is, can man trust God? The answer to the text is yes, absolutely. Um, the next question is, will man trust God? And we're going to see on a case-by-case -case basis what each individual does. And hopefully learn from their stories that we can trust the Lord. Because ultimately, um, I don't know if you ever realize this, Abraham never read his own story. His story was written after him. So that means Abraham's story was not written for him. Abraham's story was written for you. So as you look in this book, you're not looking into a book at all. You're looking into a mirror where the Lord now turns to you and says, can you trust me? The answer of the text, the answer of your life thus far, not even knowing your life is yes, absolutely. Now the question is, is will you trust him? Will you trust the Lord? Let me give you one let me give you three reasons from this text why you can actually say, yeah, I trust the Lord. From this text, not even from personal examples in your life. The first one is this. The first promise in the book of Genesis is what? That God is going to send a Messiah through the line of Eve who's going to redeem humanity. Let me ask you this. Was he good on that promise? If you follow genealogies all throughout the text, who does it lead up to? It leads to Jesus Christ who came and lived the life that you and I should have lived and he died the death that you and I should have died. God proved to be true on his first promise. Second promise to Noah. Great flood, there will be no great flood. People even today debate the actual first great flood, which means no one in their right mind thinks that there was a second flood so everyone can trust the promise of God that there has been no global flood to wipe us out. God has remained true to his promise. And every time you see a, rama a rainbow in the sky, that's his reminder to you. I'm not going to break my promise. But here's the third one, and this is really the one I want to dial your attention to draw your attention to. Abram. Abraham. God gives him three promises. What is it? I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'm going to make your name great. And I'm going to give you natural resources, i.e. I'm going to give you a land. Now here's what's crazy. Here we are in one church. I would imagine I'm making up the statistic myself, but I'm just going based on what I think and know, and I think this is fair. Today, all around the world, one out of every 10 churches, if not one out of every six, will be drawing attention to this man named Abraham. Did you know that three major world religions all consider themselves to be children of Abraham? That's Jews, that's Christians, and that's even Muslims all consider themselves to be children of Abraham. In other words, God has made Abraham's name great. 
If you take a look at historical figures, I'm talking famous historical figures over long periods of time, you're going to get a few names. You're going to get Jesus Christ, you're going to get Julius Caesar, you're going to get Alexander the Great, you're going to get Moses, you're going to maybe get Paul the Apostle, you're going to maybe get John the Baptist. You are definitely going to get Abraham. You can hardly turn to a page in the Old Testament that does not refer to the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And all I want to do right now is draw your attention to the fact that God proved to be true to his promise when he said, Abraham, I'm going to make your name great. Not only that, he said, I'm going to make you into a great nation. Now, we know from the New Testament that God proved true to be true to that. Today, we have Jews who physically are inheritance or are the descendants of Abraham. But we also know from the New Testament that it describes anyone who's a believer as a child of Abraham. Abraham has become a great, great grandfather. The song that we sing, Father Abraham had many sons, is true. God was true to his promise. And here's the craziest one to me, is this, the final one that God gave Abram. I'm going to give you a land. Think for a moment about world history and about this little country named Israel that despite the efforts of all of history to squash out that people and to eradicate them from that land, they keep coming back. That ought to be for us and to the world one of the greatest testimonies that God's promise proved to be true. He has given them the land and people will try and run them out and yet they still keep coming back despite all odds. Just think World War II alone. Literally, where we're creating, we've got cattle cars trying to kill off these people, trying to drive them out of their land, trying to extinguish them, and now they're back in it. And successfully, too. What you're supposed to see is, even from the promise of Abram, is that God proved to be true. Can you trust God? The answer is yes, absolutely. Now the question is, will you trust him? It's our hope that as we walk through the life of Abram, we, like Abraham, begin to trust him more and more. Little by little, step by step, day by day, week by week, so that we eventually become like Abraham will at the pinnacle of his life, where he trusts God even to the point of death. That's where we've been. This is where we are. That's where we're headed. I'm going to pray for us. The band's going to come on up, and um, we'll continue to worship and praise the Lord accordingly. Sovereign Father, we thank you and praise you for how good and gracious you are to us all the time. Uh, Lord, those are just a few reasons why we can trust you. I know if we were to um, have an open mic right now, and share personal reasons, Lord, um, it would abundantly, evidently uh, declare that you are trustworthy. Lord, um, m most of us, many of us, those who are believers in the room, we know you to be trustworthy. We know that we can trust you. Um, Lord, now we ask that you encourage us to actually trust you with the little things. And Lord, we ask that through the life of Abraham, we will learn to trust you even more. Please come and guide us as you so see fit. Pour out your mercy upon our heads that we might see you, taste you, trust you, and treasure you above all things and in all ways. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'd like, feel free to stand and worship.